Hello, welcome to tonight's webinar on how to be a hero in your own yard. <clears throat> My name is Deborah and I'm a volunteer here at the Minnesota State Horticultural Society. I'm joined today by our friends Russ Henry and Chesney Enquist. How's it going guys? Okay, they're there, I promise. Yes, we're uh, here. Sorry, the audio is muted. Hey, it's, it's going good. Good to be here. Yeah, the, the microphone is accidentally muted. That would be the story of my life. Okay, <laughs> a quick plug for MSHS. If you're not a member, now is a good time to join. Members receive not only our award-winning magazine, but also discounts at nurseries and greenhouses, comp tickets to our local home show, discounts on classes, and so much more. Your membership dollars also allow us to bring great programming like this to all of you. Just a few things before we get started. You are attending the webinar in listen-only mode. So you will be able to hear our presenters, but we can't hear you. That way there won't be any background noise. You will receive an email with a link to a recording of the webinar in the next few days if you'd like to see and hear the presentation again. If you have questions for Russ and Chesney, you can type those in the questions pane on the control panel on the right side of your screen and click send. If you don't see the panel, look for an orange arrow in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Click on that arrow, it'll pop out the panel. You're also welcome to use the chat panel for things like supplier names that you think everyone should be able to know about. And now, please welcome Russ Henry and Chesney Enquist. Russ Hello. is the president of Minnehaha Falls Landscape and founder of Giving Tree Gardens. He, plant, he spends his time protecting and growing ecosystems, cleaning local waterways, and educating communities about the potential to grow, <clears throat> excuse me, to grow health starting right beneath our feet. Together, his landscaping and gardening companies install, manage, and restore habitat and organic landscapes on hundreds of properties throughout the Twin Cities without the use of pesticides or synthetic fertilizers. Chesney is the general manager of Giving Tree Gardens and Minnehaha Falls Landscaping. Chesney, excuse me. Chesney enjoys practicing and training crew in low impact gardening techniques. Together, they co-founded the local advocacy, advocacy group be Safe Minneapolis to raise awareness about the importance of supporting pollinators and maintaining healthy, resilient ecosystems. And I'm gonna hand it over to you guys. Well, thanks very much, Deb. It's uh, it's really great to be here with everyone. Um, as Deb was saying, my name is Russ and I am the owner and president of Minnehaha Falls Landscaping. And uh, here right by my side is Chesney Enquist. Hey everyone, it's great to see you tonight. I'm Chesney Enquist and looking forward to dig in, digging in with you. Excellent. Well, uh, thank you all very much for joining us. And um, we are, uh, I was told by the Minnesota State Horticultural Society, uh, being joined tonight by a whole host of heroes on the, uh, on the, on the platform here. And so um, heroes, as we're going along here, this is going to be an interactive presentation. And uh, we'd ask that you go ahead and use that chat bar as we're as going through. I'm going to ask some questions, questions and, and uh, feel uh, free to feel jump free into to the, the chat bar here and, and, and please jump in with any questions you have. I'll take the questions at the end of the conversation and answer them out loud. And then, um, but Chesney will be po posting some helpful links and answering questions on the chat bar while we're going here. Well, as everybody knows right now, this world needs some heroes and we go around and do this presentation at schools all over the place and um, when i when i ask the first question to students i i get a pretty resounding answer i ask is the earth okay right now are things okay on the planet and students resoundingly yell out no things are not okay whenever we ask this question and I'll say, well, what's wrong? And we'll hear, we'll hear answers shouted out from uh, climate change to extinction, to pollution, to viruses, all sorts of uh, troubles weighing on the kids 
Um, and, and we're even talking first, second, third, fourth, fifth graders, uh, young kids with a lot of troubles on their, on their hearts and minds. And so really right now the world needs some heroes. And so what can we do to be heroes? Well, we're gonna talk about how we can grow health in our own backyard. So let's start from the ground up. So heroes, all of you heroes out there on this webinar, why don't you tell me over the chat what you see here? Which one of these on the left or the right looks a little more healthy? Go ahead and weigh in. And, um, and we'll, we'll go ahead and give you a couple seconds to answer. Not so far. And um, what we see here, uh, and the school kids usually get this one right, right away. On the left, that one's a little more healthy. And so on the left there, we'd call that soil, and on the right, we'd call that dirt. Uh, I'm a soil microbiologist or, or a nerd. And so on the left there, what I can see is that soil with its deep, rich color and um, apparently more moisture and the worms in it, that soil is filled with life. Whereas the substance on the right, the dirt, looks crumbly and loose and it's, it doesn't really look like it has any life force in it. And indeed, really the difference between soil and dirt is health and life. And, and so what does healthy soil do for us? Well, it does a lot of things. Healthy soil protects plants. Healthy soil protects our pets and animals in the yard, protects wildlife. Healthy soil protects people, including all these little first graders with their dirty hands. And it does all of this protection through a web of creatures interacting with one another that are exchanging nutrients and protecting plants. And so we call this the soil food web. And you can see from this image that underneath the plants there is some organic matter. And so the plants leave organic matter in the ground and that organic matter is essentially sugar with a little bit of nitrogen. And that organic matter is eaten then by fungi and bacteria. Fungi and bacteria are the two main life forces underground. They control uh, health in the soil and they control nutrient cycling and they can protect our plants. Um, eating from the bacteria and the fungi are nematodes, protozoa, amoebae, flagellates, ciliates, microarthropods, and then eating off of them are larger creatures, larger worms and nematodes and larger insects. And then birds come in and start eating those. And pretty soon we're growing out of the ground with rabbits and badgers and all kinds of creatures, all extending up from the soil in a web of life. And that web of life, again, is supported and promoted and, and grown by the plants who are putting organic matter in the form of sugar into the ground in order to feed fungi and bacteria and kick off the whole cycle. And so what are these microbes doing in the ground for us? Well, they're doing a whole lot. And let's talk about the microbial crop partners that we have and a few of the, the duties that these crop partners perform um, in the service of, of growing healthy plants. And so crop partners, the microbes down underground, I'm gonna talk about the two main things that they're doing for us. On the left, we see on top there, unlocking soil bound nutrients and accessing, um, enhancing access to those nutrients. And so uh, a lot of folks, and including myself, uh, I didn't understand until a few years ago when I started studying this very closely that fungi and bacteria have the capacity to dissolve sand, silt, and clay. They can literally dissolve solid rock and turn it into liquid nutrient. And then, since it's now a liquid nutrient, it is what we would think of as plant food. And so uh, the, the fungi and bacteria are out, are out there in the environment, growing underground, dissolving sand, silt, and clay, and shipping that back to the plants. And with fungi, they'll either ship it back along their, their bodies through their, the tubes in the ground that they create, um, that we call hyphae, fungal hyphae. And the hyphae are these microscopic uh, tubes in gatherings uh, of thousands of them, we call them mycelium. And these uh, mycelium are able to attach to plant roots and um, they create a beneficial relationship uh, in which the plants um, through photosynthesis create sugar, 
and then they ship that sugar down to the down to their roots and about 40 percent of the sugar that plants are making they're actually exuding through their root pores so that creatures like fungi and bacteria can soak them up the mycelium from the fungi that attach to the plant roots suck that um, that sugar into their into their bodies and eat it and in exchange the fungi go out in the environment and they're able to provide plants with about a thousand times more capacity to get uh, nutrients and in, in including um, all of the nitrogen potassium and phosphorus like we like to put down in fertilizers as well as water so a thousand times more capacity to get nutrients and water out of the soil for plants who have what we call a mycorrhizal relationship with a fungus and so Russ, about 95 percent of terrestrial Russ, plants i'm sorry to interrupt you. a mycorrhizal relationship in order to live and so this I'm is why it's very important that we start thinking about our soil and not treating it like dirt so superhero fact number one healthy soils grow healthy people plants and animals okay heroes let's have a look at this here this is two different images of soil samples taken under the microscope. Each of these are blown up 400 times, magnified 400 times. So heroes, on the left or right, which one looks a little more healthy? The school kids are pretty good at getting this one too. And they'll usually shout out the right. And so I'll ask why, and they'll say, it's got a big thing in it, a creature. What is that creature? Well, that is a nematode. And that's a bacterial feeding nematode. He's got his mouth up against a clump of bacteria there, probably sucking Russ, some of them in. Have you pause for a second. See that ball that's about halfway down his body, and that Russ. little ball is a uh, <laughs> it's what the nematode uses to squeeze out the bacteria. And chat here. So again, uh, we're looking at a nematode on the right, and on the left there we could see a lot of soil particles, tiny pieces of sand, silt, and clay. And again, these are each microscopic samples of soil blown up 400 times. And so what we see on the right is a lot of room for air and water to flow through that soil. You can see the chocolate brown aggregates, the clumps of bacteria that are sticking together. As the bacteria grow in the soil, they actually have a sticky glomulin substance on the outside of their, their bodies, kind of as a skin on their body. And that glomulin is what is uh, able to dissolve the sand, silt, and clay. It's also sticky. And so they stick, the bacteria stick to one another and they stick to, to, uh, to each other around pieces, particles of sand, silt, and clay separating those soil particles from one another so that then there's room for air and water to flow through. So you can see there's a lot of room on the right, so much room that the big old nematode can swim through there, no problem. On the left, where there's not really any room for air and water and for our microbial creatures. There's no aggregation on the left. Uh, the, the bacteria have not gathered together in, in clumps and groups around soil particles. And I'll tell you why. On the left, that is a soil that's been treated with Roundup. On the right, that's a forest soil. So major difference between the soil on the left and the right. And we're gonna get into some of these differences, but a lot of the differences have to do with water holding capacity. So uh, here's another beautiful picture of a nematode underground. We've got some amazing and mysterious creatures that do a lot of work for us. Um, not only cleaning water, uh, but also sequestering carbon and helping us with climate change. So let's watch this little video. The audio apparently isn't uh, good on, on the platform here, so I'm just gonna talk our way through this. I've seen it a few times. So what we're talking about here is soil carbon sequestration. And as we know, we've got a problem with way too much carbon in our atmosphere. Now, carbon isn't a necessarily a bad thing at all. It's actually, um, well, here, let's start. We're going to say uh, that carbon is actually a really good thing. It's the building block for all life on Earth. And it actually moved around in healthy cycles on Earth until people came along and, well, we had a different idea with how to treat the carbon. So, uh, as you can see here, there's carbon cycling in the five pools of carbon on Earth. And that worked out just fine until that bottom pool there, as we could see, 
was released by people. And we started releasing that bottom pool through fossil fuel use. And we have put 880 billion tons of extra carbon up into the atmosphere. Um, our farming practices and the way we treat soil has also greatly damaged uh, our soil's health and put a lot of carbon into the atmosphere. About half of the carbon in the atmosphere is from farming practices and unrelated to carbon burning, to fossil fuel burning. Now, all of this carbon in the atmosphere has some serious consequences, including ocean acidification. It's killing our oceans. Uh, we're causing a mass extinction of life on Earth, the, the uh, largest extinction that the Earth has ever seen, and the most rapid extinction the Earth has ever seen. And so uh, what we need to do, obviously, is stop burning so much carbon. But then we've also really got to learn how to treat our soil right. And the secret to getting our, the carbon back in the ground is really using plants that can photosynthesize, they can grow carbohydrates, and they can spit those carbohydrates as sugars out into the ground, feeding the microbes that are growing underground. As those microbes grow underground, they are sequestering carbon in the earth. So the plants act like a carbon pump and the soil acts like a carbon battery, storing all of the carbon that we put into it. Recently, we've learned how composting can really help speed up the process of sequestering carbon into the soil. So as we're going along and we're growing, we wanna stop using the chemicals and tilling methods in our farmlands, and we wanna go ahead and move towards regenerative agriculture, carbon sequestration. This is the task of our, of our lifetime. And, and it should be the primary focus of our culture to figure out how we can as rapidly as possible reforest as much land as possible in order to grow healthy soil so that we can put the, the carbon that is in the atmosphere back into the ground where it belongs. So superheroes, superhero fact number two, healthy soil helps us fight climate change. Very important to keep in mind. About half, the half, half of the carbon in the atmosphere right now is coming from our farming and land use practices. And the way we uh, manage land at home really can make a big difference. When we think about it, lawn, lawn uh, grass lawns are the number one, the biggest crop in the United States. They're also the most pesticided crop and the most fertilized and the most irrigated. So if we were to cut out the lawns from our yards, then we could really have a big impact altogether. Okay, heroes, a lot of us probably at home are composting. I hope you all are composting at home. One way or another, as long as you're composting, you are doing the right thing. Now there are some secrets to how to make, how to grow some really healthy compost, but let me just say this first. As the first thing reason we want to compost is as a as a waste reduction method. We never want to put our organic matter waste into a garbage bin because those garbage bins go to either a dump, a landfill, or to a burner. Here in Minneapolis, our garbage bins go to a burner. And if we're burning organic waste, we're burning fuel for soil health. We're also adding more carbon into the air. And because organic matter tends to be moist or damp or wet, it will burn dirty. So I took a tour of the burner downtown here in Minneapolis, and they told us that they wanna have as little organic matter in that burner as possible because it burns, it causes the smoke to come out more dirty, filled with more contaminants than otherwise it would. Now, that's the first kind of step, is we want to reduce waste. We don't want to put waste in the garbage. We want to make sure that we are uh, composting as much as possible. If, if we want to take it to the next step and make sure that we're growing as healthy compost as possible, I'm going to give you two pieces of, of advice that it, it was very hard and took me a long time to learn these two pieces of advice. Um, first of all, 50% moisture. The number one reason that people grow compost that is not effective or not very uh, beneficial for their gardens, or, or they have a compost pile that doesn't seem to break down very fast, is because of a lack of moisture. 
all of the creatures that are chomping away and eating the organic matter that we put into the compost bins, they are all freshwater creatures. They live in a very thin layer of fresh water that surrounds each of the soil particles and surrounds the organic matter in the compost. And without that water, the creatures simply can't live. They dry up and die. And so we really need to make sure that our compost pile is at about 50% moisture. Too much moisture, and we're gonna grow the wrong set of microbes, and the compost pile will turn stinky and rotten. Not enough moisture, and the compost stops breaking down. 50% moisture. Now, you don't have to go out and buy an expensive moisture reader for that. All you've gotta do is pick up your compost, a handful of it, kind of scoop back the top layer of the bin, pick up a handful of compost, give it a handshake squeeze. And if one drop of water comes out from your handshake squeeze, then you've got 50% moisture. It's an old farmer's trick that's been scientifically tested by my compost and soil health mentor, Dr. Elaine Ingham, I-N-G-H-A-M, Dr. Elaine Ingham. And she is the world's foremost expert on soil microbiology management. And so um, everything that I'm talking about, I wanna give credit where it's due. I learned from Dr. Ingham and uh, I directly menteed under her for three years. Uh, so 50% moisture is um, really the number one, number one trick to grow in healthy compost. The other kind of trick that I'd like to share with folks is this. In your outdoor compost piles, you want to take some red wiggler worms every spring and put them into the compost pile. Now, you don't have to worry about these worms. They're not the kind of worms that can go and live in woodlands. Um, they won't live through the winter in Minnesota. It gets too cold for them. So that's why I put some into the pile every year. But they make short work of composting that pile. They help move around materials inside the pile without turning it so that the fungal networks aren't destroyed from turning. And uh, they produce, uh, because of uh, the microbes that are in their stomach, as they eat the organic matter, they are leaving behind waste that is filled with healthy soil microbes. So red wiggler worms, you can usually get them from Jim's Worm Farm online or Mother Earth Gardens locally will have them usually. And uh, red wiggler worms plus 50% moisture, and you are going to have a healthy and strong compost pile. Okay, heroes. Which one of these two scenes looks a little more healthy, on the left or the right? And when I'm asking kids in school this question, and I've got some people online saying left, yes, indeed, got some left lefties here, a absolutely right. So on the left there, of course, we see a lot more blooms. We see native plants. I think there's some um, verbena in there and uh, looks like some butterfly weed and maybe some Joe pie weed in back, some beautiful native plants blooming there. Wonderful uh, um, array of a variety of uh, blooms at different times of the season, different heights, different types of flowers, different types of plants. This, this garden on the left can feed a multitude of different native creatures, while the space on the right probably can't feed very many creatures except for a few rabbits. Now it's important for us to have a healthy uh, amount of um, open grass and, and playing space so that we can have our you know, ball games and frisbee and picnic and all that. Um, but it might be important for us to start thinking about how we can, even in these types of lawn spaces on the right, start incorporating more pollinator friendly plants. So here's one, let's go over a few of my favorites for bringing in the, the pollinators. And um, you can see an amazing plant list that we have on our uh, pollinator friendly uh, blog. Um, so on minnehahafallslandscape.com, if you go to the blog post called Catching the Buzz, you're gonna find a wonderful plant list filled with all of our favorite native bloomers and a few fruiting and flowering native plants that we have recognized the bees love over time. Now, a lot of folks might recognize the, the plant that this bumblebee is on. And that flower is a swamp milkweed flower. And uh, we find that swamp milkweed tends to get more um, monarch caterpillars than any other milkweed. So um, if you're looking for one that's really going to bring around the caterpillars and the, and the butterflies, 
all the milkweeds are very great, are really important, really good to have, but the swamp milkweed seems to bring around a few more. Um, there's a few plants that uh, we've we've seen monarchs just absolutely loving over the years. This prairie sage plant is one of them. Um, also, I'd say that if you really want to attract monarch butterflies and be a hero for the for the monarchs that are facing extinction, um, you'll probably want to put in definitely some milkweed, probably some Joe pie weed, which is uh, just a favorite, an absolute favorite of monarchs when they're migrating. And then the number one monarch butterfly attracting plant is meadow blazing star all the blazing stars are good at attracting uh, monarch butterflies but the meadow blazing star brings in so many monarchs they'll be lining up around the block every time it blooms just to get onto that onto that nectar it's a really wonderful beautiful plant and great in a rain garden setting all of these plants the joe pie the milkweed the prairie sage and the um, blazing star the meadow blazing star are all wonderful in a rain garden or a prairie restoration or a pollinator pocket garden. And here, of course, we see the common milkweed, um, this monarch butterfly caterpillar chomping away, eating at that, that leaf on the milkweed. And one thing that I learned um, maybe about 10 years ago from uh, a, an author from Wisconsin named Samuel Thayer, who wrote a book called The Forager's Harvest, is that uh, milkweed, common milkweed, is edible. And um, you eat the shoots early in the spring um, when they're just coming out of the ground and you kind of eat it like asparagus. So hey, not only can the monarchs live off of it, but it's a wonderful food forest plant that feeds wildlife and people. So let's think about how pollinator gardens really, uh, how everybody can protect bees and butterflies at home with a pollinator garden. So superhero fact number three, everyone can protect bees by planting native flowers. And what we'll see when we look at this image of a native flower garden, maybe this is a pollinator pocket garden, we see that there's, this garden's a little bit messy and that's a-okay. Um, it's okay and important to have some downed wood and sticks and branches, some leftover leaves from last year and some plant stalks still in your garden. And the reason that's really important is that bees and other pollinators will come and they will chew the bark and the, the plant material up and they'll make paper out of it, combining the plant material that they've chewed up with their spit. They spit it out and that's how they form their nests and hives. And so hives are made from paper that is made from sticks and plants and, and wood that's left in the garden. Very important to leave a little bit of a mess out there for the pollinators to eat from. It's also important to have something blooming at all different times of the season. You know, early season, we want to think about having forsythia and dogwood and um, crab apples, uh, apple trees, uh, fruiting trees and shrubs, viburnums, um, uh, and then on the ground, uh, things like bloodroot and other spring ephemerals, uh, dicentra, and all kinds of fun little woodland plants blooming in the early season and in the middle of the summer, that's when all of our favorite flowers that we talked about for the monarchs really get going um, from, from wild blue indigo to Joe pieweed all the way through. And then in the, in the late summer, we think about things to, that really support the end of the season for pollinators, asters and sedum are a couple that come to mind. Very important to have some blooms in your garden all the way through the season. And think about, trees and shrubs that bloom as being just that much more volume and scale and size and and therefore that much larger a, a bumblebee buffet for all of the pollinators that are coming through um, if we just have a few little you know plantings of native plants that's good and that helps but imagine that compared to a large shrub or tree completely covered in blooms and we can see why it's very important to have blooming trees and shrubs. They provide an enormous amount of nectar and pollen for um, wild pollinators. Okay, let's talk about the lawn. Um, as we were seeing in that, that big picture uh, before, you know, it is good to have some uh, lawn space. Let's talk about different ways to manage the lawn. So friends, top or bottom heroes out there, which one looks a little more healthy? 
top or bottom. Now I'll tell you, the school kids don't hesitate for a second about this one. And so I, I have I have a curiosity about exactly, oh, I'm hearing a lot of folks say bottom here. I'm, I have a curiosity about exactly when it is in a, a human's life that they decide that it's okay to start using these chemicals because every school kid I've ever talked to about it roundly rejects the use of herbicides and insecticides um, as a management tool in landscapes. And they don't want that stuff anywhere near where they're trying to play ball. So if y'all said the bottom, and I think a lot of you did, then exactly. That lawn on the bottom is what we call a bee lawn. And so much has been made lately in Minnesota, a lot of talk about bee lawns. The state of Minnesota put some money through the Board of Soil and Water Conservation in order to uh, promote the expansion and use of bee lawns and other pollinator habitat throughout Minnesota. And what we're gonna see in a bee lawn, if you look close, you see some white blooming flowers there, that is white clover. Almost every lawn that hasn't used herbicide has white clover in it. White clover feeds over 50 species of native bees. It is a perfect example of a non-native plant that has naturalized and become an extremely important part of the native local ecosystem. And so we gotta keep in mind that native is very good. It's super important and we need to plant more natives, but we also need to recognize that sometimes non-native plants such as white clover or apple trees or a crop of healthy tomatoes can be very, very beneficial for native pollinating insects and wildlife. So there we've got that white bloom and white clover. And then we see in the foreground there, a little bit of purple. And that purple is called self heal or Prunella vulgaris. That is a low walkable, mowable ground cover plant that is included in the bee lawn mix. And it's just absolutely stunningly beautiful. Feeds another 20 plus species of native bees. It's a wonderful plant to have in a yard. And because it's purple, it really does something that I think is, is also pretty important for us. It helps us stop hating purple blooms in our yard. And so that'll come into play here in just a second. Um, what we can see on the top there is uh, this person is using some herbicide and that is really unfortunate. Um, herbicides, I, I am the former uh, chair of the Minneapolis Parks Pesticide Advisory Committee and I've done a lot of studying on herbicides and all I can tell you is stay the heck away from them. They are extraordinarily dangerous. They do not, the manufacturers do not and, the, and they are not forced by law to do any actual studies that actually inform how these things impact our health. They hide uh, 90 to 99 percent of the ingredients in the bottle, only disclosing the supposed active ingredient when actually many of the ingredients in the bottle can cause cancer, not just the active ingredient. And so um, I just say stay the heck away from those herbicides as much as possible and um, I think it's entirely possible to leave them out of the equation 100%. I've been in business for myself for 15 years as a landscaper. We maintain about 100 lawns every year. And um, over time, I've maintained many, many lawns and gardens. And never once have I used a bottle of herbicide in a professional manner. Now, before I was a professional landscaper, I gotta admit, I did use some Roundup. I, I uh, would go into the nurseries and I'd purchase fungicide and insecticide and herbicide and I would use them. And it wasn't until I started studying soil health and you can imagine that the microscopic, tiny and, and very fragile bodies of all of these microbes that our plants are relying on for health, they get killed instantly, immediately by any amount of poison, whether it's herbicide or fungicide or insecticide, it kills off all of the soil creatures that are feeding and protecting our plants. That then starts a cycle of disease and a lack of nutrition. And of course, the pesticide and fertilizer manufacturers, they have a, an answer for you when the next disease comes along. Um, I've seen it probably hundreds of times now. Herbicides encourage grubs in lawns, and here's how they do it. Herbicides kill nematodes, Nematodes are the mortal enemy of grubs. They crawl inside uh, grubs' bodies and they eat them from the inside out, killing them. And so uh, when we use an herbicide and we kill off all the nematodes, 
what we do is we're just begging the grubs to come into that space and take over. And so um, for many reasons, including your own health, the health of your pets, your family, your neighbors, and the wild animals that stop by all of our yards, I'm gonna ask us all to stop using lawn chemicals. Now, that's probably gonna lead to some weeds. So let's talk about weeds. Now, first of all, I would like to say that our lawn post about organic lawn management on, uh, on our blog post, um, that has uh, some how-to information on how to manage a lawn so that you don't get weeds and so that you don't have to use any chemicals, no herbicides. So we can help you manage without any herbicides and still have a weed-free lawn. But let's talk about these weeds for a second because weeds are actually heroes. This uh, much maligned dandelion here, uh, this is free food and medicine that grows in all of our landscapes. It actually is a plant that follows human beings because of the way we disturb soil. Dandelion absolutely loves to live by humans because we're going around and making conditions in the soil perfect for it all the time. One trick that the, the pesticide manufacturers don't tell you is that when they kill off all the soil fungi, what they're leaving is a bacterially dominated soil. Now they're, they're very smart at these, they have amazing scientific um, research laboratories at these companies and they know exactly what they're doing to the soil microbes. They're killing the fungi, leaving the soil laden with bacteria. And here's the big trick, fungi are weed preventers. So when fungi surround weed seeds, they give the seeds this chemical signal that tells them it's not the right time to start sprouting and they actually start eating those seeds. When bacteria surround weed seeds, it's the opposite. And the bacteria are given the chemical signals or excuse me, the seeds are giving the chemical, given the chemical signals by the bacteria to start sprouting. So bacteria tell seeds of weeds to sprout. And we got to keep in mind that weeds aren't just a plant out of place, like, uh, like a gardener definition that we like to use. There's also a biological definition of a weed, and that is a plant from early stages of ecological succession that has a wide seed dispersal mechanism, shallow roots, and thrives in a bacterially dominated soil. That's the basic definition of a weed, thrives in a bacterially dominated soil. And the pesticide manufacturers know that when we kill the fungi in the soil using herbicides, we are going to kill the first generation of weeds that we see, and then we're gonna cause the next generation to sprout. So it's what we call the kill cause effect. Kill the first generation of problems, cause the next generation, but don't worry because the pesticide and fertilizer manufacturers will sell you a solution for that next problem. Okay, now uh, purple blooms in the lawn. Why is it important that that self heal is coming along and adding some purple? Because I wanna give us all back our weekends. There are many people out there who I've talked to over the years who have spent their weekends, at probably evenings too, out in their lawns fighting Creeping Charlie because darn it, we got, we're supposed to hate Creeping Charlie, right? It's, it's a bad guy, it's an invasive plant, right? Well, I'm here to tell you something a little different. Creeping Charlie is a friend of bees. Every day when I'm out there in the field, I see bumblebees and honeybees eating off of Creeping Charlie. It's one of the most commonly foraged plants. And if it weren't for pesticide manufacturers out there trying to teach us to hate on Charlie, I think a lot more people would use it as a ground cover. So I'm, I'm sure, I can't see your faces, but I'm sure there's some eyes rolling and I appreciate that. I know we've really been culturally trained to hate Charlie, but I'd like us to consider that nobody likes a creep and everybody should like Charlie because he's low and mobile and walkable and the bees love him. So instead of creeping Charlie, we've given him a new name and now he's good time Charlie and we can all have our weekends and evenings back and stop fighting Charlie and start allowing Charlie to grow in the lawn where he's again, mowable and walkable. So Charlie is just fine there. And then we also will allow Charlie in some spaces to grow under shrubs and trees and act as a ground cover because all the ground needs to be covered in green. Very important for soil health that we keep the ground covered in green. And if Charlie's gonna do that for us, that's just fine. There was a University of Minnesota um, study produced that said that Creeping Charlie has varying levels of nectar in the flowers and uh, they were raising alarms about that. And I just like to say to those researchers, welcome to earth where every flower on the planet has a varying level of nectar because they're all planted in different soils with different 
um, nutrient capacities and availabilities. So um, yes, Charlie does have varying levels of nutrient in the nectar and that's good, all plants do. Okay, so letting some of these weeds go, here's the white clover with a little, little bee on it. Uh, well, again, 50 different species of native bees at least that eat off of the white clover. So these plants are all perfect for a bee lawn. You can learn more about the bee lawn program by going to the um, Metro Blooms Blue Thumb Partners website. And on that website, um, look for the bee lawn, uh, uh, lawns to legumes program link. And I think we're gonna post that here in the, uh, in the chat as well. Um, and there you can sign up to get a grant from the state of Minnesota. I will warn you, these are highly popular grants. Um, we've had uh, probably a dozen of our clients sign up for the grants and about, I think, four of them have gotten it. So a lot of folks applying. If you don't get it in the round that you're applying in, continue applying. Okay. So here are a few of the weeds that I love and superhero fact number four, weeds are free food for bees, butterflies, and people. So a couple of the weeds, I, the edible weeds that I love to eat, keeping in mind that a lot of weeds are edible. Um, uh, here on the second from the top on the right, we see wood sorrel. That's my absolute favorite weed for eating. It tastes like lemon. It's very zesty. You can eat the stem, the leaf, and the flower. It's a wonderful plant to add to a, a salad, chop it up and put it in a salad. Really fun, really cute. It's growing in almost all of our lawns. Um, and then here on the left, second from the bottom, we see lamb's quarters. Lamb's quarters is a delicious and very nutritious leafy green. Um, they say it has more nutrient than spinach and um, it grows freely on compost piles and actually helps transform compost piles even more quickly. Uh, so uh, wonderful edible leafy greens all over growing for free in our lawns. And all of these plants grow in Minnesota. Okay, friends and heroes, let's be heroes to all of our animal friends. Which of these groups of chickens looks a little more healthy and happy? The left or the right? Right. Oh, I'm seeing some folks say right. Okay. Well, and what do you think about those chickens on the left or the right? Why do they look more healthy on the right? What's going on with the chickens on the left? Now, when I ask this to the school kids, I get a lot of, looks like they can breathe on the right. Looks like there's sunshine. Um, I had somebody yell out that they hate crowds. Uh, totally understand that. Uh, I think the chickens on the left look like they're kind of bumming. Um, crowded into a factory farm environment. Uh, disease can easily spread through that space. Those chickens have a very limited diet, uh, probably a, a pretty rotten emotional state throughout their existence. Whereas the chickens on the right, um, they have all kinds of food sources that they can pick from, uh, all kinds of wonderful sunshine landing on them. And it's good to be with your friends, but it's also good to have a little space. And so um, let's think about how we can improve the, the health of the animals that we're consuming as well. Now in, in Minneapolis, we can't have goats in our yard. Um, it's not legal. In St. Paul, it is legal uh, because of St. Paul's history of having stockyards. And so um, even residents can have, uh, have goats in St. Paul. I would caution against getting full-sized goats for a residential yard for a number of reasons. First and foremost, the happiness of the goat. Goats are herding animals. They need to live in a herd. And um, when we uh, confine them or, or have uh, individual goats living on their own, they get really unhappy and they yell or bleat a lot. And um, that can drive neighbors crazy. Uh, and, uh, and then of course, a full-size goat can eat a single yard in just a couple days. Um, so it really wouldn't work to have a full-size goat in a residential space because they will eat everything. Pygmy goats, as are pictured here, might be a fun solution for folks who are wanting to raise goats. Um, you're not gonna get a lot of meat or milk out of a pygmy goat though, so it might just be for fun. Now, the animal that we can raise in the city though, of course, is chickens. So in St. Paul and Minneapolis and many surrounding suburbs, we can have chickens as pets. And as you can see here, the chickens and the cats sometimes even get along. So superhero fact number five, you can le legally raise chickens in your backyard in Minneapolis, St. Paul and many surrounding suburbs. Um, 
to note in 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 both Minneapolis and St. Paul, a permit is required in order to have backyard chickens. And here in Minneapolis, you would need to go through the uh, Minneapolis Animal Care and Control in order to get your chicken permit. And there's a a city uh, office called Homegrown Minneapolis that can help you connect with the um, with the Minneapolis Animal Care and Control. I used to be the chair co-chair of Homegrown Minneapolis, and while I was there we help the city legalize urban farming, including raising chickens. I will say that raising chickens, um, I should say that um, they might be the most expensive eggs you'll ever eat, um, but uh, they're also a lot of fun. And um, I grew up on a farm and we raised chickens and there's nothing quite like as a little kid getting to go through and, and grab the eggs every morning. and that excitement and that fun is, is just something that's great for kids and families. Okay, superheroes, what is one thing that all wild animals need every single day? Anybody, anybody? Oh, looks like our chat is not water, functioning again. Oh, oh, there it is, yay, functioning again. Good, yes, water, 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 water. absolutely. Every wild animal needs water every day. And so having a bird bath in your yard can be extremely important for bringing around those cardinals and blue jays and other birds. Uh, and, and we wanna make sure that we're offering clean water. So get out there and clean the bird bath every week and fill it up to make sure that the, the birds passing through and the everybody that's coming through gets to drink. Um, in our bird bath, uh, because it's, um, it's not able to be tipped over very easy, we have all kinds of wildlife drinking out of there. And I often see an opossum who comes through the neighborhood drinking out of our, our bird bath. And for me, that's just really wonderful. It's really fun. If you, even in the city or especially on a larger piece of property, um, might think about removing access, or excuse me, removing gates and fences so that, um, so that deer and other creatures can move through and access water. I was just talking with somebody in Edina who told me that, um, that uh, ever since they put the fence up in their yard, uh, the deer no longer walk through. And so, you know, I, I appreciate that they don't want deer in the yard. And I also appreciate from the deer's perspective that, hey, they need to drink some water. So maybe there's ways that we could all learn to live together by taking down some fences and allowing wild animals to pass through. Now, here at our house, we have a food forest. And so we see all sorts of wild animals. Um, of course, we get the squirrels, even the black squirrels, sometimes the white ones too. Uh, here's a beautiful tree frog we found one day. Um, you know, uh, sometimes the animals come in where we don't want them. And so as I was taking this bat out of the kitchen, I asked him if he'd be okay with me taking a selfie with him. And he gave me this little smile to show me that he was all right with that. Um, and uh, no reason to be afraid of wild animals. Um, of course, we want to have a healthy respect for them. Um, of course, I'm wearing this glove so the bat can't bite me. But I'm not afraid of the bat. He's just a tiny little creature compared to me. And then here's a little bunny rabbit we found in the window well. He had jumped down the window well and we helped get him out. And then here's a couple of bandits that were up in the garage now, or excuse me, up in the attic. And so we had to uh, get out some traps and catch them. And now we never use poisons uh, because we don't want to poison these creatures or any of the creatures that would eat them. And so um, instead, we do the just and ethical and moral thing, and we trap them and take them to St. Paul, and we release them there. And I'm sure somebody in St. Paul traps them and brings them back and completes that cycle of, um, of uh, forced animal migration. Uh, but again, it's much better than ever adding any poison to the system, because as you can see, all life on Earth is connected. And so if we were to, say, add some poison, um, in to, to kill the snake, um, and then the bird got a hold of the snake, well, then we're killing that hawk. Uh, if we added poison in to kill some insects, it might also kill the grasshopper, which is supposed to be food for the frog, uh, which is supposed to be food for the fish and the bird and the snake. And so you can see, if we add poison to the system, we will easily move that poison through the system. And just today, I'm very sad to say that up on Facebook, uh, one of my friends was posting with a picture of a dead owl that was a picture taken in Minneapolis and the owl was seen alive just yesterday 
and has um, little baby uh, little baby owls in the nest. And um, there was no damage to the body of the owl. It was just laying there dead. And that is not 100%, um, but it's probable that that is a, a pesticide, especially a rodenticide poisoning. So whenever folks are using mouse... Okay, so heroes, everybody in Minnesota lives on a shoreline. What do I mean by that? Well, we all live on a street and streets are essentially dry creek beds. And so we wanna make sure that um, no matter what we do, we're, we're taking all of the water that lands on our properties and we're cooling and cleaning and slowing it down before it runs into local waterways. Now, many of us live on actual shorelines right up against a body of water. And if that's the case, then we have a special responsibility. And so heroes, question here for you, which one of these shorelines looks a little more healthy? The shoreline on the left or the right? I'm sorry, I can't see it yet. And um, looks like we're getting some folks saying right. Uh, the shoreline on the right is a lot more healthy. Um, on the left there, we would be running nutri nutrients and, and minerals off into the waterway um, and warm water, and that would take oxygen out of the water as bacteria bloom, and that would cause disease to come into the body of water. Whereas on the right, we can see that those native plants are not only blooming and therefore providing food for pollinators and birds, but they're also having deep roots that can cool and clean and filter the water before it runs into the body of water. Very important for us who live on a shoreline. In order to have healthy fish in the, in the water, like this fish that my son caught so many years ago, um, that bass was there because people took care of the shoreline, planted healthy plants along it, made sure that no one ever used an, an insecticide to kill off little bugs like these damselflies so that the bass could eat so that we could eat the bass. And that is, again, how the beautiful cycle of life and, nutri and nutrient cycling work on the planet in the web of life. And so let's think a little bit more about some of these healthy shoreline plants. Now here we have a, a wonderful native shoreline plant. Anybody know this food source plant? This one is called arrowhead or um, water chestnut or wapato is the native name. Uh, this plant is a Minnesota native plant, grows in, our, um, in about two or three feet of water on the lake shorelines and lakes and ponds. And it's a really beautiful plant where we can eat the, the roots of this plant. So not only is it lovely to look at, but it's also edible. And then behind it, we can actually see some cattails. Cattails are a beneficial plant. In Minnesota, especially in the Twin Cities, we no longer have uh, the native cattail exclusively. We have a hybridized cattail that is a mix of native and, not, and European or non-native cattail. And just because it's non-native, again, very important, this non-native, the non-native cattail is doing enormous um, ecosystem benefits for wild animals. So even though it's non-native, the cattail is still home for red-winged blackbirds, home for um, turtles and snakes and lizards and frogs, uh, and also the breeding ground for many fish. So we wanna make sure um, that we stop ripping out our shoreline plantings of uh, cattail and other native plants and start respecting those native plantings. In Minneapolis, um, over the last few years, uh, Roundup and other herbicides have been used to kill cattails in bodies of water. And so Roundup was sprayed into Loring Park Pond and into Lake Nokomis over the last four years. And millions of state dollars was, was procured by the Minneapolis Park Department in uh, Park, uh, by Minneapolis Parks and Rec in order to pay for all of that Roundup spraying. And it was done just for aesthetic purposes. And, uh, and in this instance, some of the people that were pushing for it said, but those are non-native invasive cattails. Again, not true. They are a hybridized cattail and they are performing extraordinarily important ecosystem services. We have to let the cattails grow, very important. So native plants, clean water and feed, and feed wildlife. Superhero fact number seven, superheroes, 
native plants clean water and feed wildlife. Okay, rain garden heroes. Like I said, everybody in Minnesota lives on a short line of one way or another, one sort or another. And so in order to respect the fact that we are all actually on a shoreline, we need to make sure that we have some rain gardens in our yard, that the rainwater coming off of our roofs and driveways is directed and diverted into a low, uh, a low spot or a shallow depression in the lawn, and that that's, that space is filled with native blooming plants like we see here. Um, we can also use a rain garden to plant veggies. And so this is what we call a shallow uh, um, salad bowl garden. And you can see kale and leafy greens and cabbage growing in this picture. And all of these plants do really well in a shallow rain garden or a salad bowl garden. So superhero fact number eight, rain gardens protect bodies of water. And here we can see kind of a cutaway image of a rain garden. We can see coming from the gutter and downspout, we've got rainwater flowing over the roof, going down the gutter, and then being aimed into this rain garden where some excavation has occurred and they dug out a, a basin, not too deep, usually about six inches or 12 inches deep, and then they filled that space with native blooming plants. And on our blog, we have a rain garden how-to and so if you check out the blog at minnehahafallslandscape.com, you can see all about how to grow your own rain garden. And we'd be glad to help with one as well. Now, heroes grow food at home. And so growing food at home can look like a veggie garden or a food forest or an apple tree. Um, it can also look like a decorative garden that's used for uh, edible purposes. So here we've got a decorative kind of formal garden. And in the front, we can see uh, some of that bright green sweet potato vine. And that sweet potato vine is actually a variety called marguerite. And marguerite is a prolific sweet potato uh, grown for its foliage uh, in containers and in gardens. But when you dig those, those sweet potatoes out of the ground in the fall, you will find football size sweet potatoes in there. Huge sweet potatoes these things make. And those sweet potatoes are excellent in breads. You can use them, you can uh, grind them up and use them in sweet potato bread, makes a delicious bread. And actually ed also edible in this picture, behind the sedum there is yucca, and yucca is a native plant that's edible. So here we've got a blend of annuals and perennials and native plants, and a couple of them edible. And behind the yucca is actually some raspberry, and of course, raspberries are delicious. Apples are fun to grow at home. Um, I love growing the, um, the honey crisp, of course, is a really fun one. And then Nanking cherry. Now, lots of different cherries we can grow in Minnesota, but the Nanking is probably the best. It's one of the sweetest. It's a shrub or a bush cherry. And so it only gets about six or seven feet tall, um, produces a lot of cherries, tons of white flowers in the spring, and the beautiful thing about the Nanking cherry is that all of those cherry seeds will produce cherry bushes that produce cherries. So it's a, a shrub that, um, a plant that comes true from seed. And once you grow one, then you can give those seeds away to all your friends and neighbors and they can all grow Nanking cherries also. Now here's a berry that the birds like to plant for free for us. I'm sure a lot of you recognize this. This is a mulberry. And we've got some mulberries in our yard. The birds put them in and we let them grow up and we had two that grew up right next to each other so we twisted them into what we call the lover's tree and there's a couple of twisted mulberries growing around each other in the yard and after 10 years it looks pretty cool out there um, mulberries are very easy to harvest if you put a tarp under the tree and shake the tree at harvest time all the ripe berries will fall out and you can just take your clean tarp full of berries And of course, in the city, we can grow all kinds of food in different settings. Now, this is an urban farm that I actually helped uh, the farmer, Stefan, get started by um, helping him bring in dump truck loads of compost and soil and dumping that all over a parking lot slab. And so we covered up a parking lot with about two or three feet of compost and soil and wood chip, and then he planted into that. And um, 
because of the nature of land sales in the city, we actually had to move this farm two times. We picked it up and uh, we scooped up all the soil and moved it to different parking lots and, until it finally found its home for the last, I think, uh, eight or nine years it's been in one spot. And so um, uh, urban farming is a great way to have a, to have a kind of a different food production system. We've been hearing a lot about the failures of our food production system and how um, how the eaters are too far away, uh, both physically and in terms of process from the food. And so urban farms are a great way to bring food farming close to home. We've got um, some accessory uh, buildings that are allowed now with hoop houses and greenhouses being allowed for, for farming in the city. And of course, Community gardening is kind of a great way to get started towards being an urban farmer so that you can learn how to grow in a community setting and learn from your neighbors. And, and it's a wonderful way for kids to be able to learn how to grow. So here's all these kids super happy about their dirty hands as they've been out there learning how to grow in the community garden. And when we're talking about the, the growing food in the city and the urban setting, what we're talking about is a food forest. We have an urban forest and it's a food producing forest, produces food for people and for wildlife. And so superhero fact number nine is a food forest has food for both people and wildlife. As you can see here, we've got fruits and flowers and healthy soil. And then there under the tree in this image, we can see a mushroom a mushroom growing up out of the ground. And that mushroom, you know, that's edible as well. So here is a big old puffball mushroom, a giant puffball mushroom that I found growing along the river. And this puffball mushroom, um, you know, I ate that with a little marinara for, uh, or a lot of marinara for um, a couple weeks straight. That's a big old mushroom and it's not hollow. That is all, fun all edible fungi. So wonderful food. Uh, here we've got, a morel mushroom. A lot of folks find morels a little bit earlier in the season than this. Um, and uh, and then a chicken of the woods uh, mushroom over here. If you're interested in learning more about how to go out hunting and foraging for wild mushrooms, you'll want to sign up and join the Minnesota Mycological Society. And they're on Facebook and online with their website. The Minnesota Mycological Society does mushroom forays or walks with mushroom experts so that you can learn yourself how to harvest safely without having to worry about getting poisoned. A wonderful group, the Minnesota Mycological Society. Now we circle back and we kind of end with these mushrooms because we started with them. We started with fungi, with healthy soil fungi, and those healthy soil fungi are what grows the mushrooms. And so here we see what fungal hyphae look like under the microscope. This is magnified 400 times, and we can see this beautiful strand of healthy tube or hyphae, or it's kind of like the roots of the, of the mushrooms growing underground. So these tubes have a cytoplastic tip, um, a growing tip on them, and that growing tip is able to move through the soil, and it, uh, again, like the bacteria, can dissolve sand, silt, and clay as it's moving through the soil. It takes the nutrients that it's dissolving and it ships them back along that tube, along the hyphae, back to the plant roots that it's connected to, feeding the plants as it's also eating sugar that the plant is providing. So not only can we eat those fungi, but we can eat the plants that they support. And without those, without the fungi, we probably wouldn't have about 95% of the plants we know and love. So all of it comes back to healthy soil. The number one way to be a hero on the earth right now is to grow healthy soil. Healthy soil will help us cool and clean and filter water. Healthy soil will help us have healthy wildlife, healthy animals, healthy people, and healthy plants. It, it uh, will also grab carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it underground. So healthy soil is really one of the main answers to all of the big problems that we're facing today. And of course, it's a big world out there. It's a really big world filled with life and that life needs to be protected. It needs some heroes right now. And so I'm asking everybody to Go out there in the yard and see how you can start being a hero in your own yard. I'm sure most of you already are out there protecting wildlife, 
uh, growing pollinator plants at home and food and healthy soil. And teach your friends, teach your relatives how they can also be out there in the world growing healthy food and soil and, um, and a healthier earth. And do feel free, please, to visit our website, MinnehahaFallsLandscape.com. Um, we do organic lawn care. We can install rain gardens and pollinator gardens, all sorts of different excellent healthy ways to have, have a, a safe and healthy environment at home. And glad to take some questions from you. We're we going to see have, if we can pull those questions up now. We have one question from okay. Serena that I really want to make sure you get to answer. Got, okay, well, we've got some questions here, so I'm going to start on these. Let's see. Uh, first question I got is, how would you replace standard lawn with bee lawn without having to remove all the current grass? We don't want to leave the yard bare while we're waiting. That's a great question. And the way that we do a bee lawn, um, if we don't want to remove all the grass, is we'll do an aerate and overseed. So you can rent a core aerator from a place like Ready Rents, and um, you can use a bee lawn seed mix um, and we get our bee lawn seed mix from Twin City Seed. And uh, you can aerate your lawn. You can do it in the spring as long as the lawn is not wet. You don't want to aerate when it's wet uh, because that'll uh, damage the, the soil health uh, and compact soil. But um, you can come in with an aerator while the lawn is dry in the spring and then twice uh, in the fall even. So we'll do it three times per season. We'll come in with the aerator, aerate and overseed with bee lawn in order to grow a healthier, happier uh, lawn with, with some blooming plants in it. Um, so aerating a few times will really help get the, the seed in the ground. Now, you probably want to change your mowing methods as well. When you're, um, when you're, using a, uh, when you're growing bee lawn, you don't necessarily want to be mowing uh, as much as you do with a regular lawn. And so we tell folks, cut mowing down as much as possible. If you can move to just one mow per season. So you're going to let the lawn get shaggy and weedy, but you're not going to let the weed trees take hold. Um, so you might come in and you might just mow one time in the uh, in the middle of August after the heat has passed. And once the, once the temperatures have dropped a little bit, then you can go ahead and mow. And uh, most of your plants have bloomed by then, so uh, pollinators have eaten from the yard, the yard all season long. And you can go ahead and, and uh, start your bee lawn or you can mow your bee lawn at that point. You can start your bee lawn at any time of year. The fescue grasses are a warm season sprouter, and so they will it will take a little bit, a little, um, a little bit of warmth in the soil before they're going to start to sprout. Okay, let's see. Uh, Here's a question from Deborah. So Deborah is asking. What would you suggest for classes and programs for someone interested in a career to help the bees? So if you're interested in helping the bees, um, I would, uh, I would, um, well, I would say that you could go to the University of Minnesota Bee Squad. Unfortunately, a couple of people who are uh, big at the Bee Squad are also, um, and kind of in charge there are also, they're paid by the pesticide uh, manufacturers to do education and training on pesticide use. So I feel like, unfortunately, our bee squad in Minnesota at the U of M has been compromised by the pesticide companies. Um, so you might uh, also look at uh, the Pollinator Friendly Alliance. That's an excellent place. And then Be Safe Minneapolis, both great websites that you can get some information. And then we have some great info on uh, healthy bee practices on uh, and other pollinator practices on our website at minnehahafallslandscape.com. Thanks, and uh, Courtney, I think you were saying you're gonna send something over chat, which I don't see. So I apologize for on our Actually, end an awkward kind of facilitation, was... but I'm ready to receive it and then I can pass the question along to Russ. That was me, Deborah, and you just answered the question. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you That's so okay. much. That's okay. That's all right. Um, we have one more question, and then we're going to have to stop for the night. 
And the question is, our church has two big rain gardens that have become overgrown with thistle, lawn grass, and other invasive plants. How can we redo these gardens without using herbicides to get rid of the thistle? And that's from Barbara. Okay, thanks. So I'll pass this to Russ, which Barbara is asking at her church where they have two big rain gardens that have been overgrown with thistles and other invasive species. And the question is, how can they manage that without the use of herbicides? Is that the correct question? Yes. Perfect, thanks, Deborah. Yes, um, the best way to manage without herbicides is, is physical management. So one, we remove the weeds and we might use a shovel to remove them. Um, a lot of our uh, thistles will have horizontal roots that, uh, that'll form a rhizomatic kind of a mat throughout the space. And so you won't be able to get all of the roots out. And then that's why our second strategy comes in very important. And then we, so first we physically remove and then we overgrow. And so what you're gonna wanna do, if you have a non-native thistle invading, replace it with a native thistle. So we know that thistle is doing really well in that spot. The soil is primed to grow thistle. Go ahead and pop in some native thistle. And then native thistle, of course, of course is a wonderful plant in the bee, in the rain garden or the bee uh, pollinator patch. And so um, using native plants that are taller, stronger, and spread harder and faster than uh, the weeds that are growing, that's the number one strategy. Um, first, we remove what is growing there that we don't like, and then we replace it. So remove and replace with a strong spreading native plant. Excellent. Great. Well, I do believe that was all we had time for with questions. And so I know a lot of folks were asking if there's a way to get a hold of these resources and we will follow up to make sure you get all the links and the soil hero facts. And you can of course find us on minnehahafallslandscape.com. Thank you, Russ and Chesney. And thank you everyone for attending tonight's webinar. And thank you very much for bearing with us with our technical difficulties. If you have any other questions regarding webinars, please contact Lara. Her email address is on our website. Shortly after today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would really appreciate it if you would complete that and give us your feedback so we get an idea of how we're doing. Um, you also, like I said before, will get a follow-up email within 24 to 48 hours with a link to view a recording of today's webinar. So on behalf of the Minnesota State Horticultural Society and our presenters, thank you for joining us tonight. Have a great evening. <laughs>